From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, U.S. Farm Policy. What direction? I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. The winter of 1976-77 was the worst in 40 years in many parts of the country. The coldest temperatures in decades and heavy snowfall struck the east, damaging crops from the farms of New Jersey down to the citrus groves of Florida. The west suffered a tremendous decrease in precipitation, leading to a drought situation which farmers say will have far-reaching impact on crops and also on livestock production. In the aftermath of all this, policymakers must make some important decisions about farm and agricultural policy. In recent years, U.S. farm policy has been one of less control. That is, there have been relatively fewer price supports. Farmers have been left more or less alone to grow and produce whatever crops they chose. How have farmers fared under this hands-off policy? Has it helped or hurt the American consumer? Should the U.S. return to more controls? Coffee prices are soaring. What can the United States do when other countries wage economic warfare with food that they export to the United States? What should be done when a domestic agricultural industry like the sugar industry gets into financial trouble? Should the government step in and try to protect it by reducing the quotas of imported sugar? And what is the United States' place in the world food picture? Should there be an international food reserve created to meet emergencies? How do our agricultural imports and exports fit in with our overall foreign policy objectives? Welcome to another Public Policy Forum, presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Today, four expert panelists will discuss the topic, U.S. Farm Policy, What Direction? Appearing on our panel today, Dr. John Schnitger, former Under Secretary of Agriculture under President Johnson and former President of the Commodity Credit Corporation. Dr. Schnitger is president of Schnitger Associates and a consultant on agricultural policy to several committees of the Congress and to foreign governmental panels. Democratic Congressman Thomas Foley of Washington State. He is chairman of the House Committee on Agriculture and chairman of the House Democratic Caucus. Congressman Foley is a leading author of legislation on nutrition. Republican Congressman Paul Findlay of Illinois a member of the House De Committee on Agriculture and the House Committee on International Relations. Mr. Findlay is chief sponsor and author of the Famine Prevention Program of 1975. Dr. Clayton Yeiter, former Deputy Special Trade Representative in the Executive Office of the President. He previously held a variety of positions in the U.S. Department of Agriculture under Presidents Nixon and Ford and he helped develop U.S. policy for the multinational trade negotiations in Geneva. Moderating the panel is John Charles Daly. Mr. Daly is a veteran news analyst and correspondent for both CBS and ABC and served as vice president of ABC. For three years, he was head of the Voice of America. Now, here is Mr. Daly. This public policy forum, part of a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute, touches every American home and pocketbook, and in its broadest context, the stability of the international community. Now, one in 25 Americans live on farms. The rest of us buy the products from those farms, and we pay the taxes that finance agricultural governmental programs. The year of 1977, is a benchmark in, these, in this complex, uh, this sometimes tortured interrelationship, and legislation authorizing the complex of farm programs, a tangled web of efforts to resolve the agricultural crises of past decades generally expires in this benchmark year. There is a new opportunity then for Congress and the people to find new initiatives and perhaps solutions to such thorny problems as boom-bust prices, subsidies, quotas, tariffs, and accommodating the basic 
planting and harvesting cycles of our farms to the increasing sophistication of space age technology and weather forecasting. So U.S. farm policy, what direction? Representative Foley, as chairman of the House Committee on Agriculture, what changes in farm legislation do you see as most important to achieve in 1977? Well, I think 1977 is, as you say, a benchmark year, not only because of basic farm legislation is expiring, the so-called Agriculture and Consumer Protection Act, which was passed in 1973, but because a number of other major agricultural bills have their expiration date this year. And also, the most important of the nutrition programs that the Department of Agriculture administers, the food stamp program, also expires. And it will be also the first time that a major agriculture program will be enacted um, under the new Budget Act, which was first enacted in 1974. So, in answer to your question, I would say that, that one, the, the legislation will have to reflect the, the changed conditions of American agriculture since the, the 1973, uh, the continued dependence of American agriculture on international trade, but the strong uh, concern that exists in the country that the, the boast that was made about the 1973 bill, that it provided for full production with protection, has seemed a little hollow to many American farmers in recent months as the prices, particularly of grains, have dropped very dramatically. Uh, it will have to, the legislation will have to walk, I'm afraid, a rather narrow line between those who would want to see greater expenditures in this area and the rather tight fiscal constraints that exist in the Congress, for those that would want to see higher price supports for farmers and those uh, on the farm and off who are concerned that the price of supports not be so high as to interfere either with our foreign trade or uh, uh, result in the takeover of, uh, by government of stocks, which I think largely is, is resisted by most of the American agricultural community. Very briefly, I expect that the philosophy of the 1970-73 bills, more market-oriented than previous programs, will continue to be seen in the basic thrust of the bill. Uh, the questions are not so much a return to the old style of, of marketing quotas and tight allotments. I don't think that'll happen. But a question of where we're going to put these uh, target prices and price support levels. That'll be one of the critical questions. Right. Representative Findlay, as a Republican member of the House Agricultural Committee, what are the most important things that consumers have to lose or gain from 1977 farm legislation? <laughs> this year <clears throat> certainly can be very critical for the interests of consumers. I would say that the interests of the American people much more broadly are at stake. We can make some blunders, we can get loan rates too high, target prices too high, which will induce some increase in food prices, perhaps not inordinate increases, but nevertheless an upward trend. But I think the greatest damage that mischief uh, at the hand of the Congress might cause to the American people is not in their capacity as consumer, but rather in their capacity as, <clears throat> as taxpayers and as a part of the economic life of the nation. Uh, the Ford administration has actually handed to the Carter administration an agricultural plant that is the healthiest that it has been in at least 40 years. What we have at hand this year is the challenge of avoiding mistakes, the finest thing that could possibly happen for consumers as well as for taxpayers and citizens with even broader interest than that would be a simple extension of what we have now because the plant is going full blast, government payments are way down, the, the average farmer depends on income. Uh, from the U.S. Treasury only for about 2% of his income, whereas uh, before the, the uh, Republican administration it was as high as 27%. Uh, the people in the rural areas are now getting almost the same income per capita that their city brethren uh, get, and this is a radical improvement for country America. Farm exports have tripled, and this is of vital interest to every citizen. Um, I don't know what we could possibly do today were it not for the earning power 
of American agriculture and foreign markets. And as Chairman Foley has stated, we have a, a tight line to walk because we've had some test votes in the Committee on Agriculture in indicating a, a strong tendency within committee membership to jack loan rates too high, which will cause great difficulty in the marketing of farm products abroad. And if that happens, we'll have surplus conditions to contend with. We could easily uh, stumble back into the same costly surplus condition, which also led to an inefficient agricultural plant. So this is a critical year for consumers, as well as in the other capacities of the American people. All right, Dr. Schnitker, a former Under Secretary of Agriculture, you recently suggested a limited one-year extension of the present farm price support bill to allow more time to construct some fundamental new legislation, as you put it. Now, what fundamental new legislation do you uh, support? I guess I'm not so serious about fundamental new legislation as I am about the need to avoid making some serious mistakes in the case new legislation is enacted. But much of what I think about the current year was summarized by Congressman Foley. Now, I would also say that even though I suggest pretty much the extension of the 1973 Act for one more year, it isn't because it's really been tried and, and proved uh, that it can do the job. In fact, the 1973 Act has been in suspension most of the four years since it was enacted. There's been a tendency for people especially Mr. Butts before he left the Office of Secretary of Agriculture, to claim that all of the good effects of, of the 1973 to 76 period, higher prices for farmers, good incomes, high exports, were the result of the 1973 Act. That isn't fair to the situation. It's really a rewriting of history. It isn't even fair to the 1973 Act. In fact, farm policy has been suspended since the 1973 Act was enacted and we ought to give it another year to try it out. All right, Dr. Yaita, as one who has operated a 2,500-acre farm, taught agricultural economics, and who was President Ford's deputy special representative for trade negotiations, what new legislation would you like to see affecting international trade and relations? Well, John, there are really two elements to this international package. One is the uh, uh, the domestic farm legislation that we have, and the other one is the negotiating side where we're trying to reduce trade barriers around the world so that we can penetrate some of these markets that are out there. And one really has to work on both of them simultaneously. With respect to the side on farm policy, what uh, we really need to say is that uh, we want to have a domestic farm policy that uh, uh, if possible, will facilitate the movement of U.S. agricultural products on the world scene, or at, a, or at a very minimum, not hamper or impede the movement thereof. Now, some years back, we had a bit of difficulty in this regard because we permitted our support levels to get beyond world market prices, and we became uncompetitive. We, uh, a residual supplier, we often say, and uh, which means that we sold after everybody else in the exporting business uh, finished their sales. Uh, that's oversimplified, but that's the essence of it. The only way we could be competitive then was through the use of export subsidies. Uh, that's just not a very good way to operate, uh, not a good way to run the store. Uh, some changes have been made through the years. We're, we are a competitive agriculture now. I think U.S. farmers uh, can compete with anybody in the world. That being the case, we really need an environment internationally in which we can, uh, uh, can compete. Uh, and we want to avoid getting into some international regulatory schemes where we'll lose some of that competitiveness at the negotiating table. And we want to also avoid getting, uh, going back to the high price support levels that my colleagues here have mentioned already <laughs> to the point where they exceed market prices and uh, we price ourselves out of that market unless we use export subsidies. Uh, but prime, by and large, what I'd like to see is the Congressman uh, Findlay and Foley uh, uh, and their colleagues not get too eager about legislating everything in this uh, area and uh, allow some discretion with the Secretary of Agriculture in the setting of loan rates so that he can make sure we stay competitive. In other words, maybe they ought to just kind of keep their cotton-picking hands off loan rates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I just make a comment, which I... Uh, Please do, sir. I think... <clears throat> 
might be in the nature of trying to correct the record a little bit. Uh, John mentioned rewriting history. Going back to the 1973 Farm Bill, it, it was not the first position of um, uh, Secretary Butts of the Republican administration to have the program that was later enacted. It was later enacted uh, after congressional initiatives were started, bipartisan congressional initiatives, and the administration finally came into agreement on the bill. But the first position was to phase out all the farm programs over a period of five years. And what actually happened was not an administration proposal that was adopted by the Congress, but a congressional concept initiated first in the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Forestry, and the target price, for example, being generally credited to Milton Young, a Republican senator from North Dakota, as the beginning of, of a movement away <clears throat> from the more rigid uh, allotments and uh, uh, market quotas of previous programs. But we had been moving toward this over the years, over a considerable period of time. And I just state this because it's, it's sometimes, I think, wrongly said that there was a, we now have a Republican farm program, which Democrats uh, resisted. If Democrats had resisted it, it couldn't have been enacted by a Democratic Congress in 1973, which was almost as heavily Democratic as it is today. Yeah, Dr. Yadin? I was just going to supplement that a bit, John, by saying that I really don't even visualize farm policy, Tom, as being very partisan anymore. Uh, I think I a great deal of the partisanship is gone. <clears throat> and one of the reasons for that is it's become such an internationally oriented endeavor uh, <clears throat> that partisanship has, uh, has disappeared. Uh, I think almost everybody on both sides of the political aisle agrees that we want to maintain this export momentum. And uh, international economic policy is really what I would vi visualize as a, as a nonpartisan kind of effort. I was trying to make a kind of a bipartisan correction. But a little <laughs> suggestive. I thought, you know, could I just add a little more bipartisan commentary? Uh, <clears throat> I intended to salute the fine cooperation of the Democrats in the Congress in bringing about the the Ag Act of 73, and also to criticize my own party a bit for what happened to wheat loan rates last fall. I think our administration overreacted to the political climate of the time by raising wheat loan rates too high. Wheat <clears throat> consequently had difficulty moving aggressively into foreign markets, but at least that that experience should be a warning to all of us that we shouldn't go even farther in the direction of raising loan rates. And one of the problems we face in this Congress is the fact that so few of the members have any memory as, <coughs> as politicians of the high price support, high surplus, high cost era immediately after the Korean War. That's one of the problems we have, and I hope we can find a way to bring about an adequate education of these new members in time to avoid disaster. Well, I think just one point on that which might be mentioned statistically, about 60 percent of the House of Representatives has been elected since 1970. <coughs> Dr. Snippy, you want Well, we may have a bipartisan farm policy, and everything could be sweetness and light, but we had better have a big fight on farm policy this year, or we will have a disaster. I agree because we have a series of proposals being made in 1977 which are right out of the 40s and 50s to raise price support levels to levels which are unsustainable in the world market and to spend so much money on the farm programs, money which would go mainly to the big farmers, that the budget would be unbalanced and other programs which I think uh, 95 percent of the people in the country would define as higher priority programs would be starved. We've gotten off to a very bad start in the 1977 farm debate, and I don't know whose fault it is, uh, but I'll pick a scapegoat or two. Uh, the Congress, in its wisdom, I believe, required the Department of Agriculture in the 1973 Act to do some studies on cost of production. And cost of production has become the parity of 1977. We are, we are on the track of supporting farmers through the budget in big crop years at full cost of production, starting a spiral of land costs which will lead us on higher and higher and will cost five or six billion one year and six or seven another year. And if there isn't a big fight, as I say, we're going to have a disaster and it won't be a partisan fight, I agree with that. It will be a fight 
between the people who look back in foreign policy and the people who look ahead. Well, I share that viewpoint that we mm -hmm. really need to focus on these issues in 1977 because amazingly enough, as long as we've had target prices and loan rates in existence, there's still a lot of confusion as to what they are and, and how they work and what they're supposed to do. And I'm not sure even that everybody in the Congress or in the, in the agricultural community uh, uh, agree on all of this. But to me, at least, uh, the income protection for farmers should come from the, uh, from the target prices. Uh, I think that's what target prices are out there for, to give some minimum assurances in the income uh, side. Uh, loan rates, on the other hand, uh, should not be used to uh, provide uh, minimum incomes because if, if an attempt is made to do that, that is when we begin to get into these cost of production sorts of concepts that John has talked about and uh, one can always rationalize any cost of production if one wants to put a high enough value on land. Uh, and then we get the loan rates up to where we're uncompetitive. So we ought to stop talking about loan rates as income protection and concentrate on talking about target prices as income protection and keep the loan rates down uh, where they're competitive. All right, Representative <coughs> Finley, you want to... We have not mentioned up to now a, an element of great importance, and that's the attitude of the new president. Uh, Jimmy Carter from the Deep South involved himself in the production and marketing of uh, one of the historic old basic crops, peanuts, uh, has called for a balanced budget by the end of his four-year term. He has also called for budget restraint this year. Now, an interesting testing of his commitment to budgetary management is going to be the Farm Bill itself. Uh, his recommendation in regard to peanuts, for example, called for a cut of about $50 million from the level of last year. This would require some very substantial remodeling of the peanut program. So far, that remodeling is not in prospect. He's going to have to use the weight of his office to get uh, his peanut constituency to go along with remodeling the program, and I don't see that happening. The, the sentiment that has already been visible within the Ag Committee in favor of higher price supports, loan rates uh, is another term for that, means higher budget outlays. There can be no other possibility. Perhaps a doubling or a tripling of the outlay for commodity programs contrasted with the last year under President Ford. Now this is going to tear up the, the Carter budget ambitions, uh, leading to a balanced budget at the end of the of his term. So the gentleman in the White House is going to have a lot of influence on the outcome of this battle. Is he going to surmount his historic base in the Deep South and high price supports, uh, guaranteeing high prices at the expense of the consumer, or is he going to, uh, as they say in, in Lyndon Johnson country, bite the bullet and uh, force some changes? Let me ask a favor. While we're on this issue of loan rates and price support, there are some terms which to city dwellers such as I am, you discuss so complex a product as uh, a subject as uh, agricultural policy, I think need definition. So I would ask for volunteers, and there are only two or three terms I think which would help with definition to make things much clearer tonight. Loan rate. Dr. Schnitter, would you give us a definition of loan rate? Yes. Loan rates refer to the actual price at which uh, a commodity is supported. Wheat in 1977 is being supported at a level not lower than $2.25 per bushel at the farm, and it's done by way of a government loan to the farmer, which helps him hold the wheat off the market until the price is at least $2.25 a bushel. So support and loan rates are interchangeable. All right, target price. Congressman Foley, would you take that? A target price is a price set in the act, uh, often subject to escalation in terms of uh, certain inflation factors. And uh, that particular level or target price is the price that is designed to be uh, income su support or protection for the farmer. If the market prices for the, for the crop actually in the market uh, during the marketing year uh, fall below that target price on the average, then cooperating farmers get paid the difference between the actual average market price and the target price. An example would be uh, if the target price were 250, 
and the average market prices for wheat were $2.25 during the marketing year, then cooperating farmers would be paid 25 cents a bushel, the difference between 225 and 250. They are, however, limited by payment limitations, which in the uh, most uh, crops are $20,000, in rice, $55,000. There are target price programs for wheat, feed grains, cotton, and rice. Under the present contract, the 1973 contract, as I understand it, uh, the crop is, is uh, on uh, price supports for one year, and if the market falls below the, the loan rate, then the government takes ownership. And Secretary Berglund proposes a program of price support loans that would induce farmers to enter into long-term agreements to uh, store their grains and then to market the grain only in times of dwindling supplies and rising prices. Uh, this replacing the present one-year loans would have what effect? Would it, for instance, stabilize at a lower level the uh, loan payment structures that we have become used to in, in recent years? Who'd like to tackle that? Let John you do that. I think Secretary Berglund has proposed that the authority be given to extend them for two or three years in one order instead of year by year. Uh, the risk there, I believe, is in giving the farmer the option of when the loan would be terminated and when the grain would be called in. This has really got to be part of a reserve package. Uh, and a reserve, to be useful, has to be available. And uh, the only person that can manage a reserve with any, with any view to the public interest is the government. And therefore, the government has to have at least a string or a rope on that reserve and be able to terminate whatever benefits have been given to the farmer to cause him to hold it, to end the loan, to stop the storage payments, even to require the farmer to market that grain within a certain period so it will come in and do its job, prevent prices from rising much higher. But it isn't a great change from what we've had. I would agree with what John says, but I also think in fairness to the Secretary that he has suggested that under certain circumstances there would have to be uh, authority either to raise the interest rates on loans or reduce uh, the time period, somehow give some flexibility so that uh, there wouldn't be a matter of, of the farmer being able to hold them necessarily for two or three years at his option. There would be some incentives that could draw the grain into the market if necessary. Yes, sir. Fundamental issue, of course, in this area is whether we should have any kind of a formal uh, grain reserve or food uh, reserve program. <laughs> And uh, that one can become a whole lot more controversial. Now, whether one has it in, uh, first, as to whether one has some kind of a formal program, and secondly, uh, if so, whether it be in government hands or private hands or some combination of the two, and then thirdly, how that relates to what we do internationally. And uh, I think we have to be very careful in 1977 that we don't get ourselves involved in unilaterally in a grain reserve program uh, that would not work to the best interest of the United States. There have been a number of grain reserves proposals that have been floating on Capitol Hill uh, over the last several years, and they'll undoubtedly be floated again in 1977. And I would just hope that the Congress would uh, look at them uh, with a very jaundiced eye before we do something that we very much regret in terms of international economic policy. All right, Representative <clears throat> Finley, you want to say? We cannot separate the, the foreign market angle from our discussion of domestic policy either. Last year and the year before that and the year before that, we sold in the range of 20 to $22 billion of agricultural products abroad. Now, we bought a lot of farm products too, about 10 or 11 billion, but we had an immense favorable balance of agricultural trade. And one of the deep concerns I have about the mischief uh, this Congress might do to our domestic farm programs is the effect it might have on those foreign markets. If we get into price supports that are too high, uh, we're, we're going to have the buildup of surpluses. Farmers will then seek some kind of income protection. There will probably be a set-aside program at great cost. Our plant will become less efficient. We'll have less chance to compete and hang on to these foreign markets. And the U.S. dollar is going to be under even more severe attack than it has been. I want to make two points on reserves. First of all, uh, John mentioned that uh, reserve policy, uh, insofar as it exists, has to have some government levers in terms of, of making it work. 
but uh, I, I don't think anybody is proposing, anybody that I know in the, in the administration is proposing the idea of going back to large government-held stocks reserves. What Secretary Berglund has talked about in terms of extending the loan programs is farm-stored grain, or at least farmer-controlled grain. Uh, the other point is that people who are concerned in urban America about running out of food uh, sometimes aren't quite aware of the situation we have. I, I listened to a, a um, talk show one time about a year ago, and a young caller called up and said he didn't favor exporting any wheat to the Soviet Union or to any other country when we barely had enough wheat in the United States to go around for our own citizens. We've had two crops of about 2.1 to 2.2 billion dollars, a billion bushels back to back, and we use about 700 million bushels a year for all purposes domestically. Beyond that, on, as of May 31st this year, we will have between 1.1 billion and 1.2 billion bushels of wheat on hand in the carryover, the largest carryover since the early 60s. Dr. Yadin? Yes, just to supplement what Congressman Foley said on the reserve question, there are really two aspects of reserves uh, uh, that have to enter any kind of a policy discussion, and one of them is food security, and Congressman Foley has indicated that that's not a problem here in the United States, and that's true. Uh, and the other one is price stability. Some people have price stability objectives with a reserve program. From a price stability standpoint, that is one that everybody can debate. Some would suggest that there are benefits to U.S. consumers and other consumers around the world by having uh, some kind of a reserve program that would uh, stabilize uh, markets a bit. Uh, some would suggest that it's even better for farmers because it gives them a little more assurance of, uh, of income levels or price levels and a little less worry about uh, inordinate fluctuations. Uh, I'm not sure that's worth the cost. You really have to make a benefit cost calculation then as to whether the storage costs and all the other uh, elements of conducting a reserve program are worth it in terms of price stability benefits. Uh, so at any rate, that's a tough decision. Uh, on, the, on the price stability side. It's an easy decision on the uh, food security side. Looking at it internationally, if we want to throw those elements in, then it becomes a matter of if we want to do this uh, because it's going to contribute to peace in the world or better relationships with other nations and whatnot, okay, that's a decision that the administration will have to make uh, based upon all of those uh, uh, elements. But my primary point there, John, would be then, for heaven's sakes, let's negotiate it and let's get the importing nations to pick up their share of the tab. Let's not unilaterally establish a food reserve here and have the U.S. taxpayer pick up the tab for everybody else in the world. All right. Congressman Foley. <clears throat> the Chairman Foley uh, correctly said that nobody is proposing large reserves. I can't name a single member of the House of Representatives or Senate who is out trying to establish large government-held reserves. But a lot of them are out clamoring for high price supports, high loan rates. And they don't seem to recognize that, that large government-held reserves and high price supports are the two sides of the very same coin. And I'm afraid this, uh, this message is, is not widely recognized, but somehow we've got to get it across or we're going to have disaster. Well, now, there are those who say that since 1972, and I throw this out to anybody who would like to tackle it, that since 1972, we've entered a new era of worldwide food shortages. Do any of you think that is so? And if so, what's to be done? Would you like to start? This? Well, we've had extensive food shortages since 1972, and uh, during several growing seasons, a real fear that the f shortage would get even worse. Uh, these have not resulted in, uh, in large famines, but if crops had failed as seriously in 1976 in several countries as they did in 1975, we might have had. We're certainly in a, di in a much different situation in the early 70s than in the 50s or 60s when the crops were much more stable and much more predictable. Uh, one simply doesn't know whether that's going on into the future or not. Uh, personally, I'm impressed with the climatologist's argument that the weather pattern of the world has changed slightly to the worse so far as crop production is concerned, and that we have to expect slightly greater variation, more bad years in the next five or 10, 
than in the years before 1970. So I don't look for it to be famine or disaster, except perhaps locally in an occasional year. But a slower rate of growth and greater instability, yes. And looking out 10 or 12 or 13 years when 700 million people may be born in Asia alone, the question about whether the world collectively is going to be able to produce the necessary food to feed the new population is still a, still a real and open question. Uh, the, um, and I think that the, one of the things that U.S. policy should do, and I want to compliment Paul Finley because he was the author of the act, is stress uh, the, the need to put developmental emphasis in, in many of these food deficient countries on their agricultural sector. Because if we can make a mistake by providing too much food aid, too many concessional sales that, that ha will have the tendency to smother the incentive of, of food deficient countries to provide incentives for their own agriculture. And we cannot feed the world ourselves. You can't project the United States just farming more acres in Iowa and Illinois, Nebraska and Kansas and Washington, and meeting any projected populations that might occur. Well, let's run right down the line. Would you like to go next, Congressman <clears throat> Finley? Yes, I, I'm convinced myself that there is a critical world food problem. It's going to get r worse uh, and uh, rather rapidly. It's very true that the the increase in production of food has been about the same as the increase in population. But the increase in production has not matched the areas where the greatest population increase has occurred. The third world has experienced steady increase in population, advancing uh, uh, less lessened death rate, increased birth rate, which of course has uh, burgeons our population and they have not had the capacity to grow their own food at the same increased rate, nor have they had the purchasing power with which to buy food elsewhere. I think that uh, financial incentives can produce, can result in a tremendous increase in food production in the world. But the third world has to have the means with which to buy the food, or it has to be able to grow it itself. Dr. Yadda? Yes, I was just going to add, uh, Congressman Foley mentioned uh, production disincentives in some of these importing countries, and that's one of the real problems uh, uh, in the increasing food production around the world. A whole lot of nations not only do not provide incentives for their farmers, they, they have production disincentives allegedly to help consumers and keep the price of food low. Dr. Smith, okay. Congressman Foley called attention to the fact that wheat stocks especially are increasing sharply in the winter of 1977, and in fact, the world in the middle of 1977, when the new harvest begin, will have about as much grain stored away as it had five years ago, just before the so-called Russian wheat deal, or the first big crop failure in this recent era. So while the world talks about a food reserve and a reserve policy, it has built a reserve quite accidentally. Now, if we're going to avoid having that 40 or 50 million tons of increased stocks frittered away on cattle feed or sent off to Russia or someplace the next time we have a short crop somewhere and have it when we need it for a food emergency in some poor country or for price stability here at home or to export for cash to maintain our own balance of payments, then we need a food reserve policy, which simply means a set of guidelines on how we eventually use the grain that we have accidentally accumulated. It wasn't too long ago in the history of the United States that one in four families lived on a farm. Now, only about one in 25 Americans lives and works on a farm. But today's farms are producing more food for more people than ever before in history. How much influence does the farmer with his shrinking numbers have on policies which govern his business. When prices soar, are farmers making inordinate profits? Are middlemen, the food processing industry, taking all the profits? And should U.S. producers be allowed to make huge deals with other countries, such as the recent grain sales to Russia, when it might result in shortages here and higher prices for the American consumer? Now, for some challenges to our panel, let's get the views of the experts in our audience. May we have the first question, please? Gene Hamilton, American Farm Bureau Federation. We hear a great deal about the world food problem and hungry people. Some of this discussion suggests that uh, 
we're facing a situation where the world may not be able to feed its people because we don't have the capacity to produce. I have a little different view. I suspect that the problem for the immediate future is not capacity to produce, but capacity of some people to buy. In other words, it seems to me that the problem of hungry people is the problem of people who do not have capacity to come into the market system and buy food which could be made available if they had that capacity. And I wonder if members of the panel would comment. Who would like to start? Dr. Yeh? Uh, the problem is one much more one of purchasing power than it is one of availability of food, barring some uh, tremendous nat natural disaster that would uh, permeate much of the world. Uh, we, we're interested in purchasing power around the world to take this production that we have uh, coming off of U.S. farms. Now, uh, that purchasing power has been greatly hampered the last three or four years by the worldwide recession and amplified by the uh, oil crisis. Uh, the uh, actions of the OPEC nations have been devastating in this respect and have drastically reduced purchasing power for food because at the margin, countries and people have had to choose between petroleum and food. And to a considerable degree over the last few years, they've had to uh, uh, use uh, less money for food and more money for petroleum. Congressman Bowden? Well, I agree very much with what Dr. Adder said. I, I think in the long range, looking over a decade or more, we may, we may find a situation where the world's capacity to produce uh, is, is outstripped by population. Uh, there are still some major growing areas of the world that could be brought into enormous production but with very expensive developmental programs, the Sudan and the Amazon Basin and some others. Uh, but in, in the short range, uh, the food stocks have gone up dramatically, but many people still do not have the capacity to buy. And the problem with the payments, particularly international payments situation of the third world because of the oil crisis, is very, very acute. And their ability to buy food is markedly reduced. Next question, please. Yes, sir. Marvin Hayengay from General Foods Corporation. Uh, for many years prior to 1974, the domestic sugar industry was one of the controlled features under farm legislation. Since 1974, there's, they have been not uh, carefully protected. Rather, it's just been a modest tariff on imports. However, the International Trade Commission has indicated its intention to recommend a protective import quota on sugar imports. How do you believe the Congress will react to this recommendation, or is there a better policy alternative? As the author of Sugar, a <laughs> Sticky Mess in Congress, how would you like to handle that, Congressman <laughs> Finley? Well, Mr. Chairman, happily, sugar is not a sticky mess in Congress now. It was when I wrote that article back in 1966. <clears throat> Subsequent to that date, uh, the Congress had the good judgment to let the Sugar Act expire. And I'm, I regret very much that the Commission recommended um, quotas uh, from abroad. I think that's the beginning of trouble in the sugar industry again. I hope uh, that President Carter will see fit not to act upon that recommendation. It's true that some sugar producers are having difficulty under the present price situation and I'm sure some sugar producers almost always will unless we go back to a system in which government authority succeeds in keeping the market price high enough so that even the inefficient can make money. Now the price of all this, of course, is higher cost to the consumer. I'm amazed and delighted with the reaction of the market to the end of the Sugar Act. A lot of the users of sugar in this country have made contracts abroad they found out that they can deal through marketplace channels. Their, their market system, in a sense, had atrophied during the some 30 years of the Sugar Act, and now they're finally getting back into business. They found that getting out of the cage of government control, they can fly after all. And I just hope we can resist the temptation to reconstruct in any degree a Sugar Act similar to what we had in the past. Well, everybody wants a shot at this, Congressman <laughs> Foley. Well, I think that, happily enough we have a disagreement. Uh -huh. uh, I think that we, we do have a problem in the sugar area. We import about half of our sugar in the United States and we produce about half of it now. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's a question of whether we're going to have a domestic sugar producing industry very long unless we have some form of government program in the way of price supports or quotas on imports. Uh, Secretary Berglund has talked about the possibility of a very modest price support 
program on sugar, which would uh, be backed by uh, quotas to restrict imports to, to protect that price support. We're talking now about something in the nature of 12 or 13 cents, a price support at that level. It wasn't very long ago that American consumers were paying 45 and 50 and 60 cents a pound for sugar. And, uh, and they were screaming. And, and yes, indeed. But I think, at the, on the other hand, that if we, if we raise it too high, obviously that would be uh, a problem not only for the consumers, uh, raising a question of, of equity, but also the high fructose uh, corn sweetener industry would probably have an umbrella under which to take away a lot of the industrial market. But I do think some modest price support program, either through direct price supports backed by, by, by quotas, which would have to be imposed, uh, or uh, a tightening up of the so-called world quota now, is essential to protect uh, our basic cane and, uh, and sugar beet industry. If, if that doesn't happen soon, we're just going to see it disappear. Could I add just one point? Present law does give the domestic producers of sugar approximately two cents a pound protection against foreign imports. So they aren't left totally on their own. All right. Make another point if I can. The one danger for the consumer is if we get out of the sugar business in the United States, the production of sugar, we come to completely dependent on world markets. Those markets are increasingly tied around the world to long-term contracting and preferential sugar agreements that other countries have established. And the so-called free market can be a very short one a volatile one, and you risk the danger of, of wide swings in sugar prices, very cheap sugar prices in one year. A couple of years later, you might have a dramatic run up of sugar prices, and the consumers will ask the question, why are we paying 45 or 50 cents again for sugar? Dr. Yeah. Well, yes, the one thing that people who advocate uh, restrictions on sugar imports always have a tendency to forget deliberately uh, is that they're illegal. Uh, internationally under the general agreement uh, of tariffs and trade uh, to which we're a member and uh, of which we were one of the leaders in terms of its uh, beginning back in the 40s. This is the agreement under which we try to have some rules that make sense in the conduct of international trade. Now the, the quotas that we have on sugars to, to, today are uh, illegal but nobody's complaining about them because they're, they're not restrictive. But if we pass legislation now that uh, includes the imposition of restrictions, whether they be quotas or some other restrictions, we're going to find ourselves in violation of the GATT rules. And it's a little difficult for the United States to insist that other people follow the GATT rules when we don't want to follow it. Dr. Stichter. It's only fair that we can have some kind of a price stabilization program for sugar, unless we're going to argue that we should end the price stabilization program for wheat, corn, cotton, rice, and everything else. But moderation is the point, and simplicity, uh, legality too, but moderation and, <laughs> moder moderation and simplicity far more than legality because uh, the, the illegal uh, aspects of foreign trade under GATT rules are legion. Could I add just one comment? Yes, please do. The American sugar producer has really no idea today how efficiently he can produce sugar. For about 30 years, he operated under the, the most tight con government control that was ever inflicted upon the production of any commodity. The Sugar Act was the most thorough government control program we've ever had in this country, and it existed for 30 years. Now, they've been out from under the act for a couple of years. They're just beginning to test their wings. Let's wait a few more years before we decide how high the price has to be to protect the, the efficient producer. Congressman Bowie. Well, we're repeating an old argument, but, but almost every country in GATT has some kind of sugar program or is a participant one way or the other in one. And I think it's drawing a pretty tight legal bow to say that the United States cannot have a modest, a modest, and I agree with John Snitker on this, program of price support without violating GATT or creating an enormous uh, reaction. If we establish one that's technically questionable legally, we'll hear a lot about it from our negotiating friends at GATT, but I don't think the United States should be too inhibited in this area, and I do think, contrary to Mr. Finley, that if we wait a few more years, we may not have a domestic sugar industry to go back to. Dr. And all I would say is that if we're going to do, violate the GATT by this uh, new scheme, let's go into it with our eyes wide open 
and recognize that that's going to come back to us uh, with other countries then coming along putting restrictions on U.S. agricultural products and we shouldn't expect to be able to complain too vociferously then when they restrict our exports when we've just restricted theirs. I can't resist one more comment. Go. <laughs> I think the broad objective of government policy should be to permit countries to produce the products that they, or commodities they can produce most efficiently. And one of the troubles with the Sugar Act was that every year we increased the U.S. quota to screen out the foreign countries which had natural advantage in the production of sugar. Now, Paul Douglas, the late senator from Illinois, once said you could probably grow bananas on Pikes Peak if the government would support the price of bananas high enough. We can grow enough sugar in this country to supply the entire U.S. requirement. But I think the objective of our policy should be to adjust our agricultural plant so that we produce the things we can produce best and import the things that other countries can produce best. If I dared, I'd say how sweet it is. Not <laughs> May we have the next question, please? Try something sweet, too. I'm Ellen Haas from Community Nutrition Institute. And over the past eight years, consumers have learned the hard way that they have a great stake in agriculture or farm policy. By that, I mean, despite the fact that Dr. Yider said that we don't have a food security situation on hand, consumers did learn when prices went skyrocketing that they were very insecure and that there was not a safeguard or an insurance system through a food reserve plan. I'd like to know how Congress can address this issue so that it can really balance the needs of consumers with those of farmers and that what kind of operating rules can be established so that it, it won't be a farm depressant and what chances do we have of getting a grain reserve system written into legislation. Who would like to start on that one? Well, that Finley? Reserve, I, d I doubt very much we'll, we'll see that enacted, at least at the level of the committees. I don't know of, of, of anyone who proposes a, a formal reserve in the sense of particularly of a government-held stock purchased by the government. Now, in the, in the terms of the reserve concept, as John Snitker defined it with some policy, uh, we will be encouraging farm support of, of, of grains, farm storage of grains rather, uh, probably with facilities loans and with some increase in the loan period, some incentives, and probably some, also some reverse incentives to release that grain under circumstances where it's needed. And in that sense, I think we're, we may well get into a reserve policy. Congressman Finley. Consumer concern is a real problem though, because a growing percentage of U.S. citizens are live in cities. They really, I don't think, understand the importance of agricultural sales abroad. And when prices tend to rise as they did recently, and consumers began the clamor for export controls, they really struck at the heart of the American export um, economy. Farm exports are the best earners of foreign exchange. And the worst thing that could happen to the American people, not just farmers, but all citizens, would be for us to turn the faucet on and off on export uh, markets. When we do that, a country like Japan that has to import about 85% of its food to survive is going to hunt around for dependable sources of supply. And when they find alternate sources, then our markets dry up. So the attitude of consumers is a, should be a vital concern to the Congress, not because we're going to run out of food in this country at a reasonable price, because I don't think that's going to happen, but because it might trigger an urban-oriented Congress to do something foolish that would really hurt the entire country. Dr. Yida. Uh, I really believe, Ellen, that the Secretary of Agriculture has enough tools in his kit to, to, to provide an acceptable level of food, uh, of food price stability for consumers, doing the kind of things that Congressman Foley outlined, without going beyond that into a formalized kind of grain reserve with large holdings of government stocks. And uh, I really believe the better route to go is, is the, the, the route that's available now rather than to go beyond because consumers are taxpayers too. And uh, certainly one can provide an almost infinite uh, uh, degree of uh, food price stability, but it bears a cost. And if we get involved in a, in a very extensive grain reserve program with large <coughs> government stocks, 
Uh, consumers are going to have to pay for that and, uh, with higher, higher taxes in su substantial <coughs> amounts. Uh, and it seems to me that it's in the best interest of consumers to achieve a, a, an acceptable level of price stability without incurring those kinds of inordinate costs. Congressman Foley? I'll yield I'm Dr. sorry, Stinker I, first. Dr. Stinker. I'm glad we got embargoes and reserves linked finally in the same conversation because they are intimately linked together. I think embargoes the last few years have been the most divisive single action uh, affecting both the farmer and the consumer community. Nobody wants to embargo exports of grain and soybeans, and nobody needs to if we have a well-managed reserve. Again, we came close to disaster on this issue during the presidential campaign in the fall of 1976. Both candidates said in remarks that we would never again embargo exports. And the next morning, both pulled back and said, well, maybe in a real emergency, we have to. So we've got agreement. You can even talk to the farmers these days about this issue without being shot off the platform. So I think the point is that if we don't have any stocks at all, and if we, or if we have stocks and let them get away from us too quickly, then an embargo in an emergency is a possibility. But if we do, do well with our stocks, we can avoid a disastrous embargo. Mr. Congressman Just Foley. Comment, Ms. Uh, I think that uh, there, there's a problem that bothers farmers and producers a little bit. And obviously, we have to have a better communication with consumers. And I'm very much against this old concept of the teeter-totter, that when the interests of farmers go up, the interests of consumers go down, and vice versa. But there is a little bit of a psychological feeling in the, in the United States among consumers that because we experienced very, very stable food prices from the end of World War II until the beginning years of the 1970s, particularly 1973 and 74, that food stability should be a kind of a consumer right, that everything else might be going up in an inflationary cycle of the economy, whether it's a steep inflation or a moderate inflation, but somehow food is to be exempted from that. And that is an unrealistic expectation. We would hope to have lower levels of inflation and more stable prices than we've had in the past, certainly, and nothing like the run-up that occurred in 73 and 74. But psychologically, consumers go to the, to the food markets and pay cash and buy a couple of times a week, and we don't have the psychological insulation of extending the payments on cars from 24 months to 30 months to 48 months of doing some of the things that moderate the costs and other items in the budget uh, in, because of credit or other conditions. You can't really expect that food prices are going to go down or stay exactly the same if every other item of the national economy is going up by 3 percent or 4 percent or 6 percent. This public policy forum on U.S. farm policy has brought you the views of four experts in the field. It was presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many views in the hope that by so doing, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute. Washington, D.C. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036.